Okay, everybody come on back in, have a seat please, and we'll uh, engage in some Bible study. They're not listening? <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, welcome everybody to church. Uh, you're welcome. David, thank you for singing loudly, my brother. Benefited from that. That was beautiful. The Lord was honored. You just knew it, didn't you? Because we're singing majesty. It's like he loves... Amen. And you just, you could feel his presence here. It was beautiful. Uh, so welcome anybody online. Good to see you this morning. Uh, just want to cover a couple of quick announcements. Um, Wednesday evening prayer. Just remind you that we meet uh, virtually at 6.30. Uh, and then we have Pursuit of Biblical Manhood, which is our monthly meeting as men. Uh, it's always the third Saturday of each month. We'll be here at 8.30. We usually have a breakfast casserole, sit around tables, talk about uh, the Word of God and how it applies in our lives as men particularly. It's rich, a rich time of sharing real life together. It's great, life on life. And then finally, upcoming September 11th is the next installment of our Think Together and we'll be talking about gender. And the purpose really for that is to have something that's less formal. It's not someone standing at a pulpit giving information, uh, speaking, preaching truth. Uh, there will be truth shared, but then we'll provide opportunity for Q&A, for just working through, wrestling through issues in our church, in society, related to gender. Uh, so that's the purpose of that. Please pray for that. Yeah. It's important that uh, we all leave that with a good biblical, good disciples of Jesus, just biblically convicted of, in a good sense, right? Have deep convictions about what is true. So there you go. Turn to Colossians 3. Uh, before I begin, I just one quick thing. Joni and I are heading down to see her parents this coming week. Uh, down in San Antonio. We're looking forward to that. So Pastor Andy will be sharing his next installment on Jeremiah next week. All right, he started that uh, for us, I think, uh, four or five weeks ago. So he'll be here next week sharing from Jeremiah. We'll miss you, but uh, enjoying some time with the in-laws. <coughs> Excuse me. Colossians chapter 3, I want to look at verses 12 through 17. If you were here last week, you're like, we did that already. Well, we're going to do it again because it's just worth it. <laughs> it deserves more than what was given to it last week, the amount of time given to it last week. So Colossians 3, verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, <clears throat> holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, Kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God Rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What we're going to do this morning is look at these verses again, because uh, I think there's great benefit from doing so, to just glean what the Lord has for us this morning. So by way of introduction, I want to say to you that this morning, you're going to be taking a personality test. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> by definition, a personality test is a tool used to assess Human personality is designed to measure the characteristic patterns of traits that people exhibit across various situations. 
They can be used to help clarify how people may respond in different situations. I thought it was sort of interesting because after our marriage tune-up yesterday, and by the way, you missed a robust time. If you're a married couple, uh, we'll have more. Uh, it was really a rich time together. But afterwards, we this subject of, uh, what do they call it, personality test came up. So uh, it was an interesting discussion. The beauty and the miracle of this personality test that you're taking this morning is that it's the personality of Jesus Christ. It's not yours. It's his inside of you that he wants to see come out of you. And then it mysteriously and miraculously, his personality is his characteristics, his attributes, his beautiful traits of who he is, it, they sort of mesh with who we are, and we have that interesting sort of uniqueness, but similarity, very much so. So, I say all that to say that remembering the unlikelihood that these Christians in Colossae, Paul wrote this somewhere around 60, 61 or 2 AD, the unlikelihood that these Christians had actually read Matthew, Mark, or Luke, just because of the sheer date in which they were authored, tells us that the best way for them to discover the character of Jesus is to live obediently and in community with one another. As they would see his life, his personality revealed in themselves and in each other. And so I just want to say how important it is for the church to stay together. To stay together. Paul, obviously these are virtues that relate to interpersonal relationships. And, you know, as very young Christians, let me just give you a quick testimony. Very young Christians, Joni and I, uh, were involved with uh, Calvary Chapel in Rochester, Calvary Chapel, Rochester. And, you know, pastors, leaders are sinners, and sometimes they'll say and do things that you don't like. And one day our pastor did something that we really did not like. And we went home and we're like, we're leaving. And the Lord's like, no, you're not. (laughs) What is that? Like, don't run. And that's been our counsel so many times to people. Don't run. In fact, it's for that very situation that God is now, it's a crisis of faith. It's like, apply what you know to this situation at hand. And you see, because God's doing a work internally in you and in me. Together, as iron sharpens iron. We read that verse yesterday in our marriage tune-up. So one man's countenance sharpens that of another. We, it helps develop our character through these tests. So that's Paul's words. These virtues that he's talking about putting on are all related to our one another, to our love and our interactions with each other. Now I want to take a few moments. I want to talk with you about putting on. What exactly does that mean? <laughs> I want to talk about it because some translations, I use the New King James, I'm, you might have a translation that says something about sinking down into clothing or be clothed, right? If you've read that way, uh, you know, be clothed with tender mercies or compassion or so on. And the reason the translations say that is because the Greek word is in duo. And in duo means to sink into clothing. (laughs) All right, so let me just give you a few examples so you can get the idea. Like, uh, well, we're all watching the Olympics, I presume, and you see somebody win the gold medal, and oftentimes what do they do? They clothe themselves in their national flag. They wrap it around them, and they're just like, yeah, I got it, right? And you love that. couple other examples biblically. Prodigal son comes home. What's the father do? He says, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Clothe him. (laughs) Right? 
Adam and Eve, God clothed them with the garments of skins. Joseph, Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand, put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. Even Jesus himself, Pilate's soldiers, stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. In every case that I've just mentioned, the external covering was used to symbolically represent something. For the prodigal, it, in, it indicated, I forgive you. You are now identified as my forgiven son. <laughs> okay? And so on and so on. For Joseph, it indicated he's the VP of Egypt. That's an actual term, vice pharaoh of Egypt. Okay? Uh, God, thanks to you. <laughs> right? In our text... Brothers and sisters, it's so important that we understand putting on. In our text, the Christianity, in Christianity, the clothing is Christ's character, and it comes from him who is inside of us. Because the first word of my verse 12 says, therefore, which causes me then to look back a little bit, and when I come to the end of verse 11, it says, but Christ is all and in all. Okay? Christ is all and in all. Therefore, put on. Now, it, doesn't, it sounds like I go to my closet and I look at what's hanging up in the closet and I choose something that I want to wear. What do I want to look like today? Do I want to be humble today? Do I want to have tender mercies? What's the, the clothing for the occasion? Right? That's not it at all. That is not it at all. Putting on, hear me out, putting on is letting out. That's what it is. It's release the inner Jesus in you. <laughs> That's what it is. Putting on is letting out. A great example just to help set this understanding in our mind. A great example would be Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Right? He took Peter, James, and John up into a high mountain, pulled them apart, and just, like, transfigured before them. Something didn't come upon him. He literally lifted the hood, if you will, or pulled aside the clothing, and, got, and they revealed to them his inner essence, his nature. And it tells us in the transfiguration, his face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as light. His holiness, his glory, his majesty was now put on full display in front of them, which had been covered up, if you will, by his flesh. You with me? So the putting on is letting out. It's the release, the inner Jesus that is in you. Christ is all and in all. The theme of Colossians is the glory of Christ. And now we're getting the glory of Christ in very practical, everyday terms. It's the glory of Christ in every Christian. And it's seen and, seen and expressed in the body of Christ. The glory of Jesus Christ. Paul said it so succinctly, I don't know why he didn't say it here, but he said it in Romans 13, 14. He said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Okay? So I just want to be very, very clear that the virtues, the character, the personality that Paul is exhorting us to this morning, it's not something that's coming from outside of me and that's, that I'm choosing to add to my life today, because then what? Then it's incumbent upon me, it's dependent upon me to walk in that and to exercise it. Guess what? You're going to fail. He never fails. It's the power of Jesus himself through his spirit living inside of me influencing my heart, my mind, my decision-making, and as I yield to him, then he starts to appear. And guess what? People read the gospel from my life and from yours. 
And that was so especially true in Colossae, because I have posited the thing that they may not even have actually had an actual copy of one of the Gospels. Certainly not John. We know he was written a couple decades later. And Luke was sometimes... So anyway, so the, you know, people want to, who's Jesus? For, watch him. That's why Paul would say, follow me. I'm following Christ. He's not all self-centered and proud. You can just follow me. He's like, no, I'm just following Jesus. And I can guarantee you that as you follow me, you're going to see Jesus working through my life. Paul had that confidence in Jesus not in himself. So, billion dollar question. How do you put on? We've talked about what it is. It's Jesus in me being revealed. Right? Now, I'm just going to assume in answering my question, how do you put on? I'm going to assume that I'm speaking to people who are born again. All right? So you've come to faith in Christ, and now he has taken up his dwelling inside of you by his Holy Spirit, right? I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, Jesus said. So here I am, I'm Joe Christian, and I'm like, well, how do I put on Christ? And you know what's interesting is that every time Paul talks about this, on off switch <laughs> put off put on he always talks about putting off first Did you ever notice that that's what he did here you can look at it just flip back or with your eyeballs turn back and look at verse 8 now you know now you yourselves are to put off and then again in verse 9 put off the old man with his deeds put off and then you put on i know from these scriptures and from personal experience, that the process of putting off is how he gets put on, if you will. In other words, as I die, as I fight the war that is going on inside of my head, in, 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 a, in a battle for superiority, me or Jesus, Temptation and sin and lust and pride and all the junk or the beautiful virtues of Christ. As I fight those battles, as I war and struggle, oh wretched man that I am, Paul would say, I see this, these things warring in my mind. It's war. It's not a battle. It's winner take all. In the midst of that, Paul then caught a vision and he said, but I thank God through Jesus Christ who's given me the victory. So it's the putting off, as Paul's already exhorted us, mortify, put to death, deprive of power, that lust, that covetous nature that is in you, that wants something that, you, that someone else has or something that's outside, just want it. You just, you deprive it of his power, you do battle with it. You say no, you say no, you say no, you keep saying no. Quick testimony, brand new Christian driving a lumber truck, city of Rochester. I'm on East Main Street, and my delivery destination was on West Main Street. I think it was actually the other way around. I was west going east. And the shortest route was right through downtown. No problem, right? Except it's a beautiful summer day, and the sun is out, and it's noontime, which means all the women are out on the sidewalk walking around. And I came out of an adulterous background, still struggling with my flesh. And the Lord's like, you got to go there. I'm like, Lord, please. And the whole time I'm driving, I'm like, no, no, stop, don't look, don't look, don't look. I got to the other side. I was like, wow, that was cool. I don't even remember going through downtown. It was like, it was just like glory. But it was real. As I'm putting off, he starts to reveal. Fighting the war with sin within is looking to the cross of Christ. Letting Christ dominate and rule is looking to the truth of his resurrection. It's all, but that's what Jesus, Paul said Christ is all. He's my righteousness, He's my wisdom. He's my sanctification. He's my glorification. He is my life. 
He's my head. So I look to him. From whom all blessings flow. And as I wrestle with my flesh, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, I I believe from Paul's example of putting off first, and it's just just, it's an on it's a state of flux. It's an ongoing thing as you're walking through life. I'm putting off, and as I'm putting off, then guess what? He starts to manifest. He puts on. Then these things that I'm not going to the closet and saying, I need this for this occasion. I have everything I need dwelling inside of me. I think one of the great statements in the book of Acts is Acts 4.13. It says, when the Sadducees and the Pharisees and all the bigwigs saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and common men, they were astonished. And then they said, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Wasn't that fascinating? These were the very men who had actually ordered the crucifixion, death, and had confronted Jesus face to face, spitting in his face. And now here come these fishermen along, and they're like, gosh, they seem to have the same character as the one that we crucified. And they're declaring that he's alive. We're actually seeing his nature, his personality coming out in them. So be encouraged, brothers and sisters. Putting off is part of the process of putting on. Fight the good fight of faith. Verse 12, therefore, (laughs) because Christ is all and in all, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. The elect of God. Now there's a mouthful. (laughs) what's that mean? That means you're chosen by God. It also means you're the choice ones of God. You're selected and you're select. And I think in context, Paul is stressing more the aspect of you as his choice ones who have been chosen, right? Because he is now in you, You are now the gospel in the world in which you live because of Jesus in you. The elect of God, the choice choice ones of God, holy, set apart, and dearly beloved. Put on tender mercies. Tender mercies. Let me just say to you, my brothers and sisters, that these five things that Paul talks about are actually... Many of them, Jesus, it's, we will read and I'll mention them to you where it's described of Jesus, this one being one of those. So my Bible says tender mercies. Wait a minute, I didn't finish my thought. These five things are all, Jesus in some cases would use them to define himself. There was only one time in all four Gospels where he actually gave his own personality results of his, his assessment of my personality test. Guess what? I am gentle and lowly. Really? Yeah. That's who I am. If Jesus had a web page and you clicked on about, you'd see gentle and lowly. (laughs) That's who he is. That's what he said of himself. That's what he said of himself. And so... I see those words here in these five virtues that Paul is referring to. We're putting on, we're releasing the inner Jesus in us. Therefore, we start to adopt as we do battle with sin because in the battle with sin, we're, not, we're putting off that old man, but I'm pressing in toward Jesus. I want to apprehend, Paul would say, that for which I've been apprehended. I'm going after the prize. Oh, Lord Jesus, encourage your flock today. Put on tender mercies. It's an inward feeling of compassion that abides inside of Jesus or inside of you. It's a little bit different than an act of mercy. It's actually the inward abiding feeling of 
mercy, compassion that was in Jesus. Famously, Matthew 9, 36, Jesus said he, said he saw a whole massive crowd of people, and it says he was moved with compassion. I've always been struck by that because he didn't, it doesn't, it's not red letter. It's not Jesus turning to Matthew and going, now write this down. I'm moved with compassion. <laughs> but Matthew must have observed something in Jesus. It's like, my goodness, he's really affected by looking at these people who are like sheep without a shepherd. It's an inward abiding compassion, a, a, a sense of... So I just have a question for you. What's your first response when you hear or see evil, suffering, brokenness, slavery, people who are enslaved to sin? What's your first response? Is it, oh, oh man. You know, I'll tell you, the, 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 the benefit of fellowship... Right? So I got this sermon sort of in the back burner, right? And I'm in fellowship yesterday. I'm talking with a brother. And we're in conversation. I just mentioned a situation that I'm aware of. And it just blessed me. Because Mike's first reaction was, aw. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's really impressive. <laughs> is that your first reaction or is it indifference? Coldness even. Careless. Well, that's, that's Myanmar. That's, that's not America. I don't, you know. Let me encourage you, brothers and sisters. I just move away from a statement now on in a, making application a little bit about tender mercies. It's that inward abiding feeling that you have as you look at people that are around you, Right? And by the way, let me just say to you something that's so important. These virtues that we're talking about, they're in you. They're already in you. Jesus is already actively doing these things with you and me. And it's so really encouraging because I'm a knucklehead and I fail and I think bad thoughts or do bad things or say stupid stuff all the time. And yet he's like, you know what? Let's get somebody else in here. <laughs> I'm done with you. No, he's compassionate. And at the same time, he's, in his goodness, he leads me to repentance. Right? And so, oh, Jesus, you're so good. Thank you so much. So let me encourage you. Paul actually takes this word, these tender mercies or compassion, however it is translated for you, and he uses this great personality trait of Jesus to exhort you and I to sacrifice. Romans 12, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, there it is, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Paul uses this abiding character of Jesus, this personality of him who is in us, to encourage us. Don't hold back. Don't hold back from going all in on following the Lord, on living for Him as a single man, as a married couple, living on a campus. Whatever the situation in life is, this applies to you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know why Paul would say that? You know why he says don't hold back? He banks it all on the tender mercies of God through Jesus. Why would he say that? Because God knows what we're made of. He knows there's going to be failures, that there's weakness, that there's fears, that we're going to fall short. We're going to come way, way short of perfection, morally and every other way. He's like, but God is merciful. And so you're looking in the mirror and you're getting all bummed out and on the borderline of depression and the Lord like, put that away, for, put it off. Pursue me, put on. Now, as we experience this in real life, then we start to express that. Amen? As we experience it, then guess what? We express it to others. And his compassion begins to take root in us. 
Let me encourage you if you're suffering. And suffering can take a whole lot of different, what do you call it, uh, paths and has all kinds of different meanings. Paul uses this great personality trait of Jesus to comfort those who are suffering. Suffering. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. <laughs> okay? So we, Paul uses this great personality trait of Jesus to encourage us to sacrifice, to live all in for the Lord, and to be encouraged in your suffering. Been there, done that. I understand I'm with you. In this valley, I'm with you. So call out to him. Commune with the Lord. He says kindness is the next thing. You know, it's interesting. Jesus uses that word to describe his yoke. My yoke is kind. Or easy. It's literally the same word. He uses it as an adjective to describe his yoke. My yoke is kind. The definition of kindness, as I looked it up yesterday, is not harmful, gentle, kindly. Webster has a medical definition for gentle or kindly. It's benign. You all know what that means? <laughs> benign means not life-threatening. <laughs> That's so cool. That is so cool. You know what that means in real practical terms, brothers and sisters? As I think of Jesus, as I read the Gospels, and praise God we've got the Scriptures, that I get to read the Gospel in your life, but I actually get to read the Gospel, and I can see a real comparison, just like those Pharisees and Sadducees. We saw, and now we see again. I read, now I see. You know what that meant in real practical terms for Jesus? My yoke is easy, my yoke is kind. It means he was always happy to see his disciples. <laughs> He'd wait, can you imagine going to work? And every day your boss is like, God bless you, bro, I'm so glad you're here today. <laughs> I don't even care if I pay you, man, I'm just so happy you're here today. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> imagine that, how that must have affected them. And all that, that was an actual truth. His yoke is easy. It's kind. Take my yoke, my leadership, my sovereign government over your life. And I'll make you more into my image. And that's where the real joy is. In practical terms, it meant Jesus was happy to see his fellow disciples. And all that, and all that, while he was completely misunderstood, increasingly disliked, even while his disciples had selfish ambitions. Who's the greatest? Hey, you know, when he leaves, I'm taking over. So you all better submit, Peter's like. And the devil himself was breathing down Jesus' neck. And every day he got up and he was kind. I'm not here to threaten your life. It's benign. I'm here to give you life. And more abundantly. Humility. <laughs> uh, you know, Jesus displayed that so beautifully just by riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. <laughs> fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. 9, right? Here comes your king. He's lowly. <laughs> you know, in the ancient world, humility was a bad thing. You know, it, it really was. In the ancient world, the pagan world, they thought of humility as something that was dark and mean. It was low. And therefore, you get the picture, right? Well, they live in a low sort of state of affairs in that they're just like not trustworthy and mean. And then Jesus comes and gives a true definition of humility. It's like, I just don't have thoughts of self. 
ahead of anybody at all. And so he brought a refreshing view of humility. And I was blessed by Beck's words in leading worship and just that we're healed from pride. Oh, praise the Lord. He's, he's put it down in us. And so there's a genuine sense of lowliness that appears in all of us. We just don't really care <laughs> what people think. Now, sometimes age helps with that because the process of aging, you just aren't beautiful anymore, even though you thought you were in the back, whatever. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and then he says meekness, right? Uh, long-suffering. The ability to suffer for a long time without retaliation or bringing it back up into their face. Verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance or a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. And I have a question, even as. Does that mean do it the same way as? Or does it simply mean do it because he did it? I think it means both. <laughs> do it because he did it and do it the same way he did it. Now, how did he do that? Well, he died for us when we were guilty, indebted criminals. <laughs> he died for us unconditionally. He died for us. He forgave us unconditionally and freely. There was nothing that was expected. Right? It was a free pardon. Like, dude, your whole debt load, I forgive it. I'm not talking money. I'm talking moral consequence that hangs over our heads. Hence, it eliminates the scale thing, which is so prevalent in so many religions today. Well, if I can just do this much more good than bad, then when I die, I'm okay. Well, what about all that bad? <laughs> Even if you could, is this supposed to just somehow disappear? You've offended God with that. And somehow your good is going to cover up the offense that you caused him? Yeah, amen. So while we were sinners, Christ died for us. He gave us, forgave us freely, unconditionally, and completely. Paul's like, do that. As he did it, you do that. And then he says in verse 14, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And I found that interesting, by the way, that if I was writing the Bible, I would have taken this last virtue of love and I would have added it to verse 12. It's like, let's do six instead of five, Paul. We'll just add love there at the bottom. But it's interesting that he purposely seems to separate love from the other five, not because it's, well, because it's the highest quality of Jesus, the personality trait. So how are you doing, by the way, on this personality assessment, <laughs> right? This is not to define, this is to define where am I today? <laughs> and if you're seeing not a lot of this or you're not familiar with it, then maybe there's a little bit of putting off that needs to happen. <laughs> Put down the pride, right? That's the whole point of, I think, Paul is saying in these words, but above all these put on love, which is the bond of perfection. By the way, love is not a gift. You all know that, right? You go to Corinthians 12, 13, 14, the great chapters, 12 and 14, about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Love them. Love's not a gift. I guess it is in a sense that it's the love of God that is given to us freely, but in the context of spiritual gifts, no, love is the character of Christ. It's his essential character that is poured into your heart by the Holy Spirit. Love's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the primary fruit of the Spirit from which all these other beautiful attributes flow. What this means in practical terms 
in the life of Jesus, love, it means that he didn't wait for others to love and appreciate him before he would love them. And I think that's why Paul says, and above all, initiate. Don't wait for time to heal. In fact, Jesus said it. You're in church, you, got, you know somebody's got a problem, there's a grievance, and he's not in church. Do you ever notice that? Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. If you come to my altar to worship me and you know that somebody has ought against you, leave your gift and go get right with your brother. It seems to indicate that the brother's not coming to church because he doesn't like you anymore. He's like, well, let's, we'll just time will heal that. The Lord's like, mm. above all these things, put on love. If God had waited for man to love him, we're all going to hell. But he didn't. John said it clearly in 1 John. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He appeases the wrath of God and exposes or expunges the, the guilt of our sin on the cross. That's why I think Paul would say, above all, everybody just initiate with one another to keep the unity that the church should have. And then he says in verse 15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And be thankful. And by the way, <laughs> Paul's little thing there, be thankful, that's not just some little add-on. That's Paul saying in context, this whole putting on thing is Jesus in you, and it's the miracle of his spirit working, and you can work in co-laboring with the spirit and him being revealed in you. Be thankful. Oh my goodness, I know you're thankful. I know you are. Because you do and you say stuff, it's like, man, there's a day I never would have said or done that. I know me well enough. But the fact that I'm saying it and doing it today, that's nothing but the sheer grace of God working in me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I personally think that what Paul says in verse 15 is the outcome of our obedience and everything he said prior to that. Peace. Y'all need peace. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. He's actually speaking about them corporately. By the way, it's already given. It's already, his peace is given to us. Remember Jesus' resurrection morning? Comes into the room, breathes on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. Peace. Right? Walks into the room. Peace unto you. Right? We have peace with God because of the gospel, and now I have the peace of God. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Now, rule is a famous word that has been preached many times, and it's a great word. Because it literally means to umpire. <laughs> okay? So the umpire stands behind home plate and he calls balls and strikes. Right? Or there's a squeeze bun, tag, you're out. Right? So let the peace of God say, no, you're out. Or no, this is safe. This is good. So the peace of God, therefore, kind of becomes a rule that directs or decides or determines. I will say to you, my brothers and sisters, if you're not having a sense of settled, rest, sort of peace, as it applies to the multitude of situations we find ourselves in, then do some soul searching. And if it's really related to something like super important, like where's God calling me next, or is this a person I should be involved with for the rest of my life, and there's not a sense of peace, don't do it. Don't do it. Right. I know it's subjective. I know that. Is. But it's actually coming from an objective person, Jesus, in me. And there's just not a sense of peace. You know, Jesus had, a, he kind of lost his peace for a, for a minute there at the Last Supper in John 13. It says he was troubled. He's like, oh, something's wrong here. Why? Because the devil's in the room. He's about to go after Judas to betray Jesus. 
Jesus wasn't, I don't think, as troubled as much about the devil as he was about his friend. Brother, where are you? You're all concerned about money. <clears throat> but the peace of God rule. The word rule is kind of the same, actually is the same word where Paul would say, Famously in Corinthians 9, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize, the award, the laurel wreath? Been watching the Olympics, obviously. <laughs> right? What's the point? Paul is saying, right? The award goes on and it confirms you're okay. You won. God gives us this peace. You're okay. We're one. The battle's over. You're going to hell. Yeah. You're a holy man. You're loved by God. You're chosen and you're choice. And I have a sinful nature, and Paul's very honest about that. Hence, he would say put off. And so, as I'm walking through life, it's like all my desires and every molecule of my body is screaming like, go for it. And the Holy Spirit's like, I'm not really into this. And you're like, okay, then I won't go for it. And so many times, revelation comes out, truth, and it's helpful. And there's times we do it against the peace of God when, there is no, when it's not ruling and saying, no, that's not safe, that should be out, and we go for it. And then we regret it, and then we fall back on the tender mercies. <laughs> so thank you, Lord. I failed again, but you're compassionate. In verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and in all wisdom. There's some punctuation stuff there that uh, sometimes that could be, or that could be read, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Come on. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing. It could be read that way. It's interesting. And then he talks about the different types of songs, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. That to me just speaks of joy. <laughs> there's love and there's joy and there's peace. That sounds good. That's the Holy Spirit. Right? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. What's that mean? It literally means the message about Christ. Let it be predominant and prominent. Yes. There's a slight difference. Let the message of Christ be predominant. It means it's the common or regular mode of thinking that I have every day. And let it be prominent, meaning it's the first thing that I think of. It's the primary thing. I think about the message of Christ. In real practical terms, I was talking with a dear friend of mine, and I was a bit surprised because they were very honest and transparent with me in a way I hadn't heard before. And they said, you know, when I wake up in the morning, my first tendency is to be, is to think, I could go into depression right now because of the news, because of struggles inside and so many other things. But I remember the message of Christ. Jesus is my friend. He gave his life for me. God loves me. God is my father. Jesus is my friend. The Holy Spirit lives inside of me. Yes. Let that dwell in you right. richly. richly. Abundantly. Abundantly. Yeah. Right? Prominent and preeminent. Right. When my friend told me that, I thought, I do the same thing. <laughs> really? That's like so many times it's how I wake up in the morning. It's like I need you to work today. Maybe I shouldn't look at the news on my phone before I go to sleep. I don't know. I probably don't. <laughs> you want to bum yourself out, read the news. <laughs> and then finally, Paul says, verse 17, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, that's just a, that's sort of a broad brush, isn't it? He talks about all the internal virtues, the, the personality test. Where he's gone through this and, he, and he's done it for the purpose for us to assess and to be encouraged. And then he goes into the, your word, to your actions. He goes, now, with all that in place, whatever you do, 
do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Which just kind of covers the whole gamut of all your situations in life. And I just, in closing, I have to just, I'm going to quote Jesus. Because you can't get any better than He comes to the end of his life, John 17. He says, Father, I've glorified you on this earth. I have finished the work you gave me to do. But he didn't stop. And then he immediately says, and I have manifested thy name to those that you gave me out of the yes. world. And they have believed. Amen. That's because good. they saw God in me by the way I lived. Amen. Full Amen. of compassion. Matthew wrote that down as he observed Jesus. John put his head on Jesus' chest. Oh, glory to God. He's like, oh my goodness, this man. Yeah. What, what moves his heart? Right. Heart beat again. Beautiful life of Christ. He's all and he's in all. Yes. I've asked Beck to close us in a, come on up Beck, and just close us in a very simple song that was written by Salty the Singing Songbook. <laughs> many, many years ago. It's a simple little song, but um, it's so beautiful. And I pray that um, it just embeds what we've read here this morning. Let's just pray. Let's stand first and, and we'll pray. Lord, to go through this together, I'm just, mostly, Lord, I'm just so thankful for understanding what it means to put on. Because I would always read that and felt like, i got to do this. And yes, there is a command, but it's really, it's walking by faith, it's walking obediently. And these characteristics that at one time were outside of me are now inside of me. So Lord, I pray for your church that we will manifest your name in all that we do. That they will see the beautiful life of Jesus Christ. Make us beautiful, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.